We are switching gears from the previous few weeks and switching back to the gospel message. And this is a conversation that we will be entering into. And this conversation is not an easy one for us to understand or even hear. Jesus is continuing to prepare his disciples for the path that they must walk. And while he is their teacher, he also leads by example in many things. We know that the community that followed Christ was very closely connected, and they knew his day-to-day -day movements, so they had to know everything that he faced. The opposition and the danger, they knew about it all. But in addition to that, Jesus is being called many different names by many different people. And Beelzebub is only the tip of the iceberg for all the things that he will withstand in the days and weeks to come. But in the midst of this tension and the learning that he's offering, Jesus gives them a daunting challenge and something to think about as they continue down the path and continue to follow Jesus. Knowing all of this, let us listen closely to the gospel message as it comes to us from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in a time of prayer. 
Holy One, you challenge us to look at ourselves, to examine our faith. Help us to focus on the right part. And to that end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you, but I find this text very challenging for us to work through. Especially on a day like Father's Day, when we are meant to be celebrating those familial relationships that connect us one to another. Yet, we are presented with words that do not make us feel warm and fuzzy and full of love. Instead, these words cause us to shrink back, to close our eyes, and to hope that they might just go away. Maybe if we push them off, they won't be there anymore. But... These words haven't changed for centuries. These words have been discussed and studied, and everyone is hoping that there might be something more made out of them. That maybe these could be turned into something that we really want to hear. Yet nothing can be done to change the fact that this is what Jesus was teaching his disciples as they were preparing to face the world without him. And even now, it still falls on our ears with harsh tones. See, we know that the world the disciples will be thrust into once Jesus is gone is not warm and cozy fireside meals or breakfast on a beach or lounging on a side of a hill. The world that the disciples are thrust into is filled with threats and danger. There are aggressive words directed not at Jesus anymore, but at them. They know that there is a vulnerability in following Jesus that puts all followers in difficult situations. This discipleship requires risk, and sometimes those risks are hard to wrap our heads around. Jesus, in this passage, is offering warning, but also comfort. He reminds the disciples that God cares for each and every living thing. Jesus reminds them that God knows intimate details such as the number of hairs on our heads. And while there is a threat of violence and death, those concerns shouldn't be the primary force. Instead, they should trust that there is mercy and love in the midst of all the danger and turmoil. So the idea for the disciples is that they must stay firm in their commitment to follow Jesus. And following Jesus should be their focus and their primary mission, which may, in fact, bring about conflict. We know that Jesus calls the disciples to be peacemakers. But sometimes the act of being a peacemaker leads to a sword. The very act of peacemaking, as Jesus has demonstrated, generates violence. But the end game of it all is healing, restoration, and victory over death. That's a thing we don't always get. The gospel is meant to shake up our values. It's meant to rearrange our priorities to reorient our goals, and yes, to upset the system. Following Jesus is not about how to fit Jesus neatly into our perfectly curated lives. 
Instead, we are challenged to find where we are called to be in God's life. We are meant to look for ways to bring forth God's kingdom on earth, and sometimes our relationships can hold us back. Sometimes our need for approval might keep us from walking the path that leads to the cross. The place where God is calling us to actually work toward humbling ourselves to the point of understanding is at hand. It's connecting ourselves with the humiliation, the suffering, the shame, the opposition, and even the death that Jesus himself endured, trusting the promise of finding our lives, and also aiding God's kingdom in the process. In moments such as this, we are called to be the people who do not follow systems just because they are there. We must examine what has been put in place and then hold it against the words of Christ against the justice of God. God's love for the world empowers us to not live lives where we think we know the answers or where we assume things to be true. Kingdom work is not for the faint of heart. It is for those who are ready to follow Jesus wherever Jesus may take them. We are asked to follow Jesus, to upset the system, to make a real difference in the world that brings about God's kingdom on earth. May we follow unafraid and go where Jesus is already leading. Amen. <laughs>